welcome to the Friday Night Talk. Um, the talk this evening is Don't Take It Personally. And our speaker is Mike George. Um, and we've, Mike is, for those of you who've not met him and are joining us for the first time, Mike is an author of books, including Being Yourself, Don't Get Mad, Get Wise, The Seven Myths of Love, um, and then many, many more. Um, and he shares his writings as well as his talks with insight and humor. And he's bringing three, cre three key strands together for us. Self-awareness, emotional intelligence, and continuous unlearning. So Mike is going to be sharing on Don't Take It Personally, and he's going to explore a few themes with us. What is our personality that makes us take offense? What in our personality makes us take offense? Sorry. Why are we easily triggered to react emotionally? Why are some people totally unaffected when they're insulted? And then how do I liberate myself from this, this kind of suffering? Mike's going to speak for um, around 40 minutes. And then after that, he's going to do a short meditation, a three minute guided meditation uh, to just experience and reflect on what he's sharing. And then following that, if you send in your questions through the question and answer link or in the chat section, I'll be very happy to put your questions to Mike. Mike, over to you, thank you. <laughs> uh, thanks, Artie, and a very warm welcome to everyone once again. And uh, here we are two years later, <laughs> still in front of a screen, still talking to no one, although I know I'm talking to someone. It very often feels as if I'm just talking to myself, <laughs> which of course you can't do. All you can do is talk. So the subject tonight is... Uh, as you know, this idea of um, taking things personally. Why do we take things so personally? In other words, why do we react to any situation? And that's what happens when you take something personally. You, you react, you become reactive. And uh, Artie mentioned this idea of personality. And, and this is really the key, is understanding um, our own personality if I'm going to understand why I react and how to set myself free from reacting. And uh, the personality is, is something that we create. We're not handy and it's not uh, there already. It's, it's something we create in our consciousness, our persona. The Greeks, as you know, as many of you know, um, had this word mask or persona. In other words, our personality is something that we kind of create and wear for the benefit of others. Yeah. And we're, we allow ourselves to be influenced by others when they say, well, you should have such and such a personality. But the personality is made up of different strands. It's like a matrix, really, of tendencies, of traits, of, of habits and and so it's like this, I kind of use the metaphor of the bird's nest. It's like all these tweaks, all interwoven. It's all kind of, it's like a mess inside, if that's the right word. And so this is what our personality is. And at the heart of every one of those strands, which leads to some kind of um, action, at the very origin, the very heart of each strand is something called um, a belief. And um, this is what makes all our personalities slightly or a lot different, as we all learn to absorb, to assimilate, and to create different beliefs. And, and together they make up our own personal belief system. So whenever you react to someone, it means that at the deepest level of your personality, which you created, which is an aspect of your consciousness now, it means that someone has triggered, 
triggered that particular strand based on that particular belief. In other words, if they disagreed with you and you started arguing, you started arguing for your belief. Yeah. And the emotion is fear or it's a little bit of anger. And in other words, you've started to make yourself suffer. And so that's what emotional reactions are. Reactions always contain an emotional explosion of some kind, a little one or a big one. And it means that you are allowing your persona, your personality to explode with a little bit of energy, <laughs> a little distortion in the energy. And that energy is called emotion. And it's because um, we become what's called attached to our beliefs, attached to our emotions, attached to. Um, well, I'm going to talk a little bit about attachment. I know it's a little bit of a, a, a word that's used a lot in these kinds of talks, and it's possibly kind of assumed that you know what it really means. But it's important to see what attachment is, what happens when you're attached to something. And um, it, for most people, many people, it tends to just stay at a physical level. You know, I'm holding on to, to um, a lamp or a chair or whatever. And people might say, well, you're very attached to that. And in fact, that holding on with my physical hand is not attachment. You know, it's just holding on. And I could let go at any moment, who knows? But real attachment happens within consciousness, within the energy of your consciousness, which is what you are, what I am, it's what each one of us is. Not what we see in the mirror. And I know many of you have heard that before, but it's always useful to hear it again, is that you are the invisible being of consciousness that animates the form that you see in the mirror. And in that energy, and if you want to use a metaphor of uh, you know, the ocean, the, the water or, or, or light, it doesn't really matter what metaphor you use, but that energy, within that energy, you create a mind. When you want to give form to your thoughts, when you want to give form to the energy, to your vibrations, and bring them into what's called a thought form. Yeah. In other words, if, if you're looking at me now, so you're, you're recreating the image that you're watching on the screen of your mind. In other words, you're giving form to the image on the screen of your mind. You could close your eyes and imagine me, and still you could give form to the thought of Mike George on the screen of your mind. And that's where your thoughts take form. Images, ideas, thoughts, beliefs, concepts, all of those appear in the mind, which is a function of your consciousness. You know, but the mistake we make is we go into what's on our mind. We lose our sense of self in what's on our mind. We become attached to limited by. If it's a small image, we make ourselves small. We contract our sense of self into the idea, the image, the memory, the belief, the concept that's on our mind. And then if someone comes in, I don't agree with you. And we're instantly, we lose ourselves in what we think about what they're talking about. And what we believe what about what they're talking about, we lose our sense of self in that belief. And then that defines us. And we start to argue, we start to defend, we start to project. And that's what an argument is, defense and projection. And we feel disturbed when we hear their belief, which doesn't agree with ours, which doesn't agree with me. I take it personally. It's a little bit like, you know, when you have a car smash and your first, your first reaction is, oh my God, look at my car. Yeah. So that's a demonstration of the emotion of maybe anger, maybe a little bit of sadness. There's an emotional reaction of my car is being damaged. So there's an attachment to the belief that is my car. Whereas some people, they don't do that they immediately go to the other person and go, are you okay? How are you feeling? 
Are you all right? Is there any 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 blood? Any da have you ever done any damage to you? And so they're not attached to the car. They're that's a secondary thing. It's not my car. It's it is how are you? And so they're extending their energy, the energy of their consciousness, as care. So they're caring about the other. So they're detached in a sense. Unless, of course, there's like, oh my God, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> which means they've got the image of the damaged other person in their mind and they're losing themselves in that image. Yeah. And so they're becoming emotional. <gasps> Are you okay? Oh my God. Oh, that's not care. Care is cool. Care is quiet. Are you okay? Is everything all right? And so the, the difference there is the difference between emotion, emotional reaction, and conscious response, a feeling response. I feel. Yeah. So tonight, what I'd like to do is take you on a little bit of a journey. And I, as I was saying to Artie, it is just a journey. It's just to set up some signposts, which may be useful for you. We'll maybe raise more questions than answers. Who knows? Uh, I hope so. Um, but I'm, as always, going to encourage you to to, to use what I share with you as a signpost for yourself. And of course you won't remember it all. So just sit back and enjoy the journey uh, uh, as it's kind of plotted out. As we explore in a little bit of depth, um, why we take things personally and, and how not to really. So to do that, um, let me share my screen with you. And, uh, and, and this, as I say, Raise just as many participants can now see your screen, but I can't. Oh, I forgot to uh, not share. Okay, let's do that again. Ah, yes. So let's. Uh, good. Don't take it personally. So uh, if I get rid of all the other stuff on the screen, it gets it out of the way. And um, our journey begins. How are you doing? How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. I'm doing just fine. As many people say, even in the face of uh, lots of insults and lots of accusations and lots of judgments, they say, I'm doing just fine. So on the outside, we're very good at making things appear that we are just fine. We even say, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm okay. And, and inside, of course, well, the real meaning of fine, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with this, or many of you will be, the real meaning of fine is defined by four words, flipped up, <laughs> which is a, a, a nice way of saying it, insecure, um, I'm a bit neurotic, and emotional. That's why I'm saying I'm fine. And this is what people say, because they believe that's what other people need to hear in order to get their approval, to get their, their acceptance, really. I'm fine. But inside, they're hurting. You know, because of those insults, because of those judgments, because of those things that people have said about or to them, in fact. So inside, they're taking things personally. They're taking it personally, but they're suppressing it. They're not letting the world know. And they're saying, I'm fine. Why is this? Now, why? This is the interesting question. So, let's explore and understand what it means to take things personally. And there's seven basic principles I've shared. And the first one if you are gently curious with yourself, in yourself, you know, not, not sort of, um, I've got to know, not with tension, not searching, not seeking with this kind of um, um, determination, well, I've got to know that, I've got to know what's really true, but just be gently curious and, and gradually over time, that will grow your awareness of what's going on within you. But, but it's necessary to be gentle with yourself, in yourself. You know, I'm curious, yeah, what's this guy gonna talk about? I'm curious. So the principle, the first principle we've talked about, in a sense, is consciousness is what you are. It's, that's an easy thing to say, but it's actually 
quite difficult to be aware that consciousness is what I am because everything we've learned and everyone around us wants us to be everything but just consciousness. So the key word in that statement is is. <laughs> I am. Yeah, I am. I is. Same thing, really. And so you are responsible for all that you create in your consciousness, for your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions, your beliefs, your, your, your concepts. You create everything at every moment. Even when you're watching the TV, you're recreating what you're seeing. And, and so you are the creator. You are a creator. Again, this is not something that we're taught. So whenever you react, it means you create emotion, energy in motion. Emotion, for me, is a distortion of the energy of your consciousness. This is why love is not an emotion. True joy is very quiet. You know? <laughs> Happiness is not an emotion. These are not emotional states. They're, they're not energies in motion. They're quiet, they're calm, they're easy, and they're not reactive. You know, they're conscious states of being. Whereas emotion is not conscious. It just reacts, erupts. So any emotional reaction means you are attached to something or someone. You know? And at the very core, every attachment that you form, it's based in a belief. And you know that you've got some belief about something or someone when you say the word mine or my partner, my car, my house, you know, my idea, <laughs> my belief is, my purpose in life is. And so you become attached to it. You know? and, and so that means there's going to be at some stage a challenge. Something is going to test um, that particular object, idea, person, and that's when you're going to emotionally react. And you will justify sometimes your reaction by saying, well, I was just trying to defend, or I was just trying to look after, just trying to care. But as long as it was an emotional reaction, it meant, it meant that you were looking after yourself. You were feeling threatened first. So emotion is really an expression. It's an expression of a resistance to what is. So if you think about when you are challenged and you react, then you're in a state of resistance. And the reaction contains some emotion pushing them away. And they just are. They're just being what they are. They're saying what they're saying. They are what is. And it is what is. So any emotion is an expression of your resistance <laughs> to what it is. Just that one line alone is enough to take away and explore um, on your country walk tomorrow. Uh, when you see this clearly for yourself, then you'll see through the illusion of mine. You know? Because what you thought was mine has been challenged, has been insulted, has been judged. What you thought was me, my, mine, is an illusion. Nothing is mine. <laughs> Nothing is mine. And itself, too, is worthy of exploring. So only when you realize that does this idea of acceptance, allowing things to arise naturally, so by accepting others as they are, and you know this is the right thing to do, by allowing others to be and to do what they want to be and do, you know, deep down, you know this is the right thing to do, then these will arise naturally, but only when you see through the illusion that that person is mine, that family is mine, that object is mine, that thing is mine. And as long as you believe they are mine, you are trapped in and you are not free. Yeah. So once again, freedom is the destination. When you're reacting, when you're taking things personally, it's a sign that you are not free within yourself. So what do we become attached to? Well, the first thing to notice is the symptom of attachment. And this is a 
emotion. Um, emotional intelligence isn't really about becoming more intelligent, it's about becoming more aware. I'm curious, I'm feeling sad, I feel the emotion of sadness. I feel jealous, which is really an aspect of anger. I feel this mistrust towards them, or I feel anger, I feel scared, worried, tense, anxious. I'm feeling fear. These are all emotions that I feel. And I feel worried about this. I feel resentment towards that. You know? And so I'm feeling the emotion. So I'm not saying the emotions are right or wrong or good or bad. They're not right, wrong, good or bad. They arise, they come up in a reaction. It's okay. It's much more important to be curious and to become aware of them and to say, wow, it's interesting. Yeah, why? So when th someone threatens or damages or takes away what you're attached to, you take it personally. Yeah, and these are, the kinds of emotions that we create. And you, you, we kind of know this. We're aware of this, some more than others, some more clearly than others. So what you're doing is you're making yourself suffer. You know, because sadness and jealousy, and mistrust and anger, they're not feelings of contentment, of, of, of stability, of strength, of calm. They are disturbances in your consciousness. And they're disturbances which are forms of suffering. This is where suffering has its first expression, or it's where you first know it within yourself. So the reason, the cause of the symptoms of these emotions, the cause is your attachment to objects, to people. You know? so, so it's not that you push people away to be detached, it's that you change your relationship with people. You change your relationship with objects. They're in my life. They're for use. They come in and then they go. And then they come and they go. People come and go. Objects come and go. Everything comes and goes. Yeah. But what we do, we spend most of our life trying to hold on, stop them going, stop them. <laughs> and that's because we want to become attached. And if we don't, physically attached, of course, then we attach in our consciousness. And you know you're attached to some person when you're thinking about them, when something else is in front of you, when someone's making a demand or asking you a question or, 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 or working with you to get a task done, for example, but you're thinking about this other person all the time. That's a sign that there's an attachment to that person or to that object. When you're thinking about them and they're not present, they don't need to be thought about. And that's what we do with memories most of the time, is that we fall back into nostalgia and, and the media and entertainment industries love feeding our nostalgic inclinations as, as they remind us of, of experiences that we've memorized and we are now attached to those experiences. And if, if what they show us doesn't agree those memories we uh, react oh that's not right that's not good that's not that's not the way it works <laughs> and so we react that's okay it's not right not wrong there's going to come a time when you notice you have the habit of keeping reacting and you're going to get a bit tired of it and that's when you start to be very curious but up until that point there's a good chance that you will tolerate the upsetness, the emotional reactions that you, you create. Comfort zones and pets we get very attached to. Animals, ask most people and they'll tell you. That's why they love cat videos and dog videos on YouTube. And, and why they're, they become very soft and gooey and start crying as they watch how these animals are, are relating to their human, human um, companions. So it's not right, it's not wrong, it's just to be aware that it's me that's creating the emotion, not the scenes, not the animals, not the pets. Ideas we get very attached to, this is my idea, better than your idea, I'm going to prove it to you, and here I am, I'm very, I'm going to force it on you. If you don't like it, I'll tell you, I'll tell you why this is the best. And so we start to force ideas instead of just offering. I'm not saying don't have ideas, 
offer the idea. And then if it doesn't sit, doesn't land well in the consciousness of the other, that's fine, that's okay. Time to move on. And then the deepest is our beliefs. Actually, they're all, all our attachments begin with a belief at some stage or other. This is why our education system teaches us to believe certain things which are not as accurate as they could be. <laughs> yeah. For example, we learn to believe that security and success is gained only when you have a lot of money and a lot of stuff. And of course, having a lot of money and a lot of stuff doesn't bring security and a feeling of success. It brings the opposite. But we believe and are deeply in our consciousness, many of us, not all of us, believe that they do. And so we spend our life pursuing a lot of money and a lot of stuff. You know, and, and then wondering why we never feel satisfied or fulfilled. It's like an obvious, it's an obvious one. Where the beliefs that we learn about how the world works are not accurate. And that's why it's important now to be gently curious in order to grow our awareness of what's really going on. What's really happening? So when these attachments and the consequent emotions become habits, they lead to certain personality traits. You know? and so traits like, I'm always playing brilliant victim. I suffer from this dis-ease dis called victimitis. I'm always blaming others for how I feel. I'm always seeing myself as a victim of circumstance, not realizing that I'm the creator of the reaction to that circumstance. There's a, a, a neediness that arises out of attachment to someone. I need them to be in my life. I become dependent on them. And so I have a personality of neediness and dependency. It's not right, not wrong, not good, not bad. I'm not saying you are like this or everyone is like this. I'm just saying notice when these strands of your personality come through. Some in some relationships, not in other relationships, a little in some relationships, it all kind of depends. Everyone is different. Some people are very grasping. They're always looking to try and get something because they've learned to believe that when they get what they want, only then can they be happy yeah, instead of rediscovering the natural state of happiness, which is already within us, which only occurs when you stop grasping. <laughs> and then searching, we talked a little bit about earlier on, is the search is necessary and yet it's not necessary. It's, it's real and yet not real because what you're searching for is already here and yet i need to be free of the other habits personality traits that i've developed i need to be free of those get them out of the way so that i can see clearly what i'm searching for which is my own peace my own beauty <laughs> there's that word again and then there's people who are habitually violent they become very violent, not just physically violent, but violent in their use of words and their use of their emotions in their use of their behavior. They're violating themselves. You don't realize that yet, but they're violating the nature, the true nature of their own being, their own consciousness. So these traits then become our vulnerabilities. Yeah, they, they, we have a little bit of each of all of them in our personality, some more than others. And so it's our vulnerability, they, be, they become our vulnerabilities because we, we're telling people you know, where our buttons are. You know, when someone sees us reacting in a certain way to a certain situation, ah, no, I, know, I, know, I know how to, I know which button to press to get them going. Children are very good at this with parents. They do this unknowingly. You know, they do this unknowingly to get the parent to react. And then they feel, oh, I know how to get my dad to react. And so they, be, they start to feel their own power. But it's a false sense of power in a sense. So it's when people come to know where, how, when to press your buttons. You know? In other words, that's why you don't feel free. You feel as if you're walking into a set of relationships or a relationship with the other person or other people. They know just what to say or what to do. And you know you're going to react. Oh, God, here I go again. 
you know, and, and, and of course, the easy thing to do is to project onto them how you've reacted, what you've created in yourself. And of course, we forget that it wasn't them, it was me. It's not right, not wrong, not good, not bad. It's just a question of understanding, it, first of all. For example, any emotion is a sign you are taking things personally. So anger, for, for example, uh, the simple reason for anger, it is a simple reason, is I'm not getting what I want, or you're not giving me what I want. You're not being the way I want. So when you argue with someone, it's like you're creating the emotions of frustration and anger. And because you're arguing for your belief, which you believe is right, and they are wrong. And so you're seeing their belief as a threat. To your belief and so you want to make them as right as you are and that's why gradually you get more and more angry get more and more upset more and more frustrated whereas the true conversationalist the true dialoguer if you like is prepared to yes lay out what they believe to be right at this moment in time but they have an open mind and they're prepared to combine their idea, their insight, whatever they've learned with the other persons. They're prepared to combine as opposed to being proved to be right. Well, you know the old saying, I'm sure you, you know the old saying, you can either be right or you can be happy. <laughs> you can't be both. You can either be right or you can be at peace in yourself. So fear, um, this means that I'm about to lose something. Fear is always future focused. If you notice, whenever you're scared, you're always looking ahead of this moment now and this time that you believe you're going to lose something, um, a comfort zone or uh, an object, a person, a place, an idea, an opportunity, a reputation, you believe you're about to lose. This is what gives rise to anxiety, which is the beginning of fear. So when you watch your team, for example, you create the emotions of fear and excitement um, when you're watching your team play, whether it's a hockey team or a football team or a basketball team or whatever, because you believe the fear is they are going to be scored against and therefore lose, or there's the excitement that they're going to win. And so it's like a double-edged sword. It's the two sides of the same coin, fear and excitement. You know, they're both emotional reactions to what's happening in front of you. In other words, you're taking things personally. They're both challenging your beliefs. And my belief is my team should win you know, all the time. And I'll be very excited when the other team <laughs> lose. <laughs> yeah. Or a sadness and means I believe I've lost something. Something's gone. And that's why sadness always follows loss. And loss in, in, in the romantic Hollywood movie is, is always about losing another person. And so they, they exploit our emotions because they know we will create sadness and sorrow when the fictional character leaves the fictional character in the love rom-com story that Hollywood produces. <laughs> it's not even uh, real, it's a story. It's not even happening in real life, it's happening on a screen and we're feeling sadness and sorrow. And so then we step out into real life and we've got that habit woven through our persona, our personality. And so we easily feel sorrow or sadness when we hear about a friend's partner is left or whatever. And so we then make ourselves suffer. Yeah. So you can begin to see the connection um, between belief, emotion, and the reality of things that happen in life. So to be able to not take it personally, it's necessary to realize, and you will have these realizations, if you're gently curious and you grow your awareness, you'll, you'll have aha moments that it's me that's creating the emotional reaction. If you haven't had that moment already, <laughs> it's not the other person, another situation, 
It's not the news. It's not what's in the movie that's making me emote and feel the emotional reaction. It's me that's doing that. Yeah. I'm using what they're giving me in my mind to make me react. So in reality, in reality, uh, the key word here is reality. You are not attached to anything or anyone. You know, in reality. You know, but what's on your mind is the image of that person. You know, but it's just a fleeting image. It's not real. It's just passing through. It's not real. The only reality is your consciousness, is your being. You know, and that being is quite silent and still, unchanging. You know, that is what's real. You know, this is why they say that truth is that which is eternal. So truth, reality, almost the same thing. The reality is that which never changes. Eternal. And that's you. But you've got images and ideas passing across through your mind. And you're jumping into some for a long time and jumping into it. Some ideas for a little bit of time, jumping into the image of a person for a little bit of time, and then jumping out, jumping in, jumping out, jumping in, jumping out, losing yourself in, coming out as the images and ideas change. You know, Hollywood knows this. This is why they're so wealthy at that end, because we get addicted to what's not real, because it generates, we believe it generates an emotional reaction which is why we go to the movies, so that we can falsely create this emotional reaction, and then we become addicted to it. Then we go back for the next installment. We go back for the next movie, so that we can emote some more and feel that emotion and feel alive. <laughs> They're not daft. They know how to exploit our consciousness. So no thing, the third thing that you realize is no thing is yours, but you get to play with everything. Everyone, everything that comes into your life is for you to play with. It's for use, if you like. It's how do I use it? Not, not usury, but what do I do? This person, why have they walked into my world? Why are they relating to me? What have they come to teach me, to show me? How can I get the best from my relationship with them not get them to do something for me but what is it that they've brought to me that i need to see clearly so they don't belong to me they're not mine my partner is not mine my partner <laughs> if you if you carry that through into your attitude towards them then it's likely they'll run away yeah you're mine. Um, no, I'm not really. <laughs> so the fourth um, insight that you're liable to have is no one is to blame for getting in the way. You know, there's nothing in the way. You know, there's nothing in the way. And the reason for that is, and this is very deep, is there's nothing that you need you don't need anything yes your body needs food your body needs physical environment to live in but you the conscious being don't need anything everything you need is already within you and when you use what's already within you what's already there then everything that you need at a physical material level shows up easily without you becoming tense or anxious or worried that you won't get your physical needs met. I mean, that's the basis of, of many a, a book about how to live our lives, is, is to give what you already have, and then by giving it, you know what you have, then you will receive in return that of equal value. At a different level but it will come back and then finally this is not me trying to say that there are no problems 
and there are no challenges in life. Yes. I mean, you could say there are problems until you realize there are no problems. There are challenges to face until you realize that you don't need to, to face challenges to live life in a fulfilled and satisfied way. You know, there are no problems. Problems is a perception. There are situations, there are events. Everything can be improved. Yeah. But, oh, God, this is a problem. Oh, it's terrible. Oh, it's awful. Look, look, I'm weighing myself down. I'm reacting. Oh, God, this is a big problem. That used to be like that. Now it's like this. And so there's a sadness. I've lost that. And now this is occurring in front of me. Oh, this is a problem. And so I'm going into sadness, going into sorrow. I'm creating it. I'm suffering from it. Yeah. <laughs> And that's why it's necessary, absolutely necessary, to get to know yourself, to see for yourself. And that's what happens when you know thyself. It's ancient wisdom. I'm sure you've come across it before. It's to sit in contemplation or meditation or whatever you want to call it and really see for yourself what's going on within your consciousness. And as you do, you'll gradually have these insight these realizations so when you're betrayed and i'm sure this will come up in a question what happens if someone betrays me then <laughs> expect them to break their promise <laughs> and the, the the reason that you feel betrayed you're taking it personally because they promised me they wouldn't talk about us in that way or they wouldn't share the secret i shared with them yeah. And so you expect them, there's the attachment. You believe, there's the attachment, that they won't break their promise. You expect them not to break their promise. But what do people do? They break their promises. And so you're bound to be betrayed at some stage. So expect them. <laughs> when you are being blamed, realize that the person who's blaming you is avoiding responsibility their own responsibility, and they're projecting onto you. So when someone blames you, they're angry at you, they're upset with you. So they're avoiding the responsibility of knowing, if you like, that they created that emotional reaction and they're projecting it onto you. In other words, it's what we do with other people. We blame them for how we feel. So they're blaming you how do they feel? No, they're not. They're not saying, what they are saying is that you made me feel, and that's not true. That's not true because they made themselves upset. They made themselves angry. I mean, isn't that good news? <laughs> isn't that, you're not responsible. You've got to be careful. You can't go through life going, Oh, that's how you feel. Oh, that's your problem. That's not my problem. If you do that, that's called arrogance. That's you avoiding yeah. your role in that relationship. Yeah. So when someone disrespects you, notice it's because they lack self-respect and they're projecting that onto you. So can you respect someone who doesn't respect you? There's a challenge. That really is a challenge. Well, because you've become dependent on getting respect from other people. When someone disrespects you, you take it personal. So in order to not take it personally, it's necessary to maintain your respect for all other people, regardless of what they say or do. <laughs> That's challenging, isn't it? That's very challenging. When you feel insulted, when someone insults you, it's because they're trying to make themselves feel better. And they believe that by having a go at you, they will feel better about themselves. So watch it. When you insult someone else, then is it because it makes you feel greater or better in yourself? 
Yeah, that's a mistake. Not right, not wrong, not good, not bad, just a mistake. <clears throat> when you feel as if you've lost something, you know, we take it very personal. What's a personal loss? That person's gone, that money's gone, that, that house is gone. I feel as if I've lost something. And yet you watch people, as soon as something has gone out of their life, they stand up and get on with their life. They start again, they move forward. They don't dwell on their loss. But the truth is, you cannot lose anything you know, because you don't have anything to lose. And nothing is possessed. People, objects, ideas, whatever, nothing is possessed. <laughs> and so therefore, you don't lose anything. And therefore, you can't be sad. Things come and go. First the theory and then the practice. And you'll get many opportunities to practice. When you're criticized, you know, just be aware that the other person who's criticizing you is attacking you. But what they're doing is they're attacking a ghost. You know, but they're not really attacking you. They're attacking a ghost. So let's finish with what's called the ghost principle. So it's not you that they're insulting or disrespecting or criticizing or attacking. It's their version of you. And everyone creates their own version. And I often say to people, and maybe I've said it to you at some stage, is that where am I for you right now? If I was in the same room, you would probably say, you're sitting in front of us in the room right now. And I would say, no, I'm not. And I'd ask you to look at the question again, where am I for you right now? And only once you've dwelt in that question, gently curious that, that he's saying when he's not in the room, then maybe you will realize that I am in your mind and you are creating your version of me in your mind. So what are you doing with me in your mind, in your head right now? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I can never know because I'm not inside your head. That's entirely up to you. And I definitely can't control it. So when you insult or criticize me or anyone, you insult and criticize yourself. In other words, the image, the idea of that person in your mind, which is really an attack on yourself. In other words, you're distorting the energy of your consciousness that you're using to create the image of me in your mind. Yeah? And so you're really attacking yourself. Would you attack yourself? Would you? Consciously? <laughs> and yet everyone is doing it all the time. They're really attacking themselves. They're distorting the energy of their consciousness and then projecting that distortion onto the other person you know, because they believe that the other person has made them feel, is making them feel, making them think, making them do what they think, feel, and do. And that belief is not true. Okay, so let's uh, have a quiet moment together and uh, let that sink in and just uh, relax your body and relax your being and uh, look away from the screen if you can and rest your eyes gently somewhere so that the attention is not drawn into what's moving on the screen. And just allow yourself to be very quiet on the inside with all those ideas and thoughts, insights. Allow them to sit on the back burner for a few moments.
and begin to feel the quietness, the calmness. that is always present here at the heart of your being. So there's no movement. Thoughts are calm. Feelings are quiet. And here I am, simply present, radiating that presence. And the only you in all of our lives, and that moment is now. There is no past, there is no future. There is only now. I am now. Thank you. Mike, thank you for taking the time and sharing this, sharing this evening. I guess I really appreciate the care you use words to convey ideas with such clarity um, so that our journey becomes more whole and clearer for us. And thank you for taking that.